We are equipped with many effective means for blocking potential pathogens from entering the body, including the skin and the mucous membrane as physical barriers. Furthermore, enzymes such as lysozyme can be found in tears and sweat and are capable of destroying many would-be invaders chemically. However, despite these significant external barriers to infection, an occasional pathogen may make it inside our body. Upon infection, the body sets into action with the inflammatory response. This response is nonspecific, attacking any and all foreign invaders. And if you've ever had an infected cut, you've seen it in action. Think for a moment about what signs you associate with infection in a cut. Perhaps you thought of redness, swelling, and pus. These are symptoms that the inflammatory response can help to explain. Upon injury, invading pathogens such as bacteria and viruses have a means to enter the body. Luckily, the injured cells immediately begin to release distress signals. Damaged mast cells in the connective tissue release histamine. This influx of histamine to the site of injury immediately begins to change the behavior of blood vessels in the region. Arterioles open while venules narrow, resulting in increased blood flow. This new pattern of blood flow can explain the redness and heat associated with infection. Furthermore, the capillaries within the injured tissue will begin to dilate and become leaky. While it may seem that leaky blood vessels are the last thing you want in an injured tissue, they are in fact crucial to an effective inflammatory response. To understand why, consider for a moment the components of blood that would be helpful if they could make their way to the site of injury and infection. Foremost on your list is likely to be platelets and their associated clotting factors. Indeed, both platelets and clotting factors will exit through the leaky capillary walls and migrate towards the site of injury. These elements serve a dual purpose. Not only do they help to heal the wound and seal damaged blood vessels, but they also confine infectious agents to the wound site, slowing their spread throughout the body. Meanwhile, a second line of defense is on the way. Cells near the injury release a series of chemical signals which radiate from the site of inflammation. The signals are known as chemokines, and their concentration is greatest in the area immediately surrounding the infection. The gradient of chemokine concentration provides an important roadmap for phagocytotic white blood cells, including neutrophils, as they make their way onto the scene. Following ever-increasing chemokine concentrations, phagocytes exit the leaky capillaries and enter the site of infection. Here, they go to work engulfing and destroying the pathogen's presence. With the infection taken care of, the wound site begins to heal. After they engulf pathogen particles and eventually die, these white blood cells eventually make up the pus that we associate with infected cuts and scrapes. Finally, with pathogen particles destroyed and damaged tissue repaired, histamine signals begin to fade and blood vessels return to their normal size. The inflammatory response has successfully dealt with a pathogenic breach of our body's outer defenses.